Hello friends and welcome back to the channel where we delve into the mind of a villain. In this entry we'll be taking a look at the fictional company of Omni Consumer Products or OCP from the Robocop trilogy. As a disclaimer please note that all characters and corporations mentioned here are purely fictitious. Any resemblance to real people living or dead is entirely coincidental. Now with that said, let's proceed. A mega corporation whose greed caused their own downfall, OCP was the underlying antagonistic force in all three films in their attempt to control and privatize a futuristic Detroit. Just like all companies that turn evil, the fault lies with a few key players, namely the management. As the saying goes, the fish rots from the head. In this video, we'll be taking a look at some of these evil executives and their nefarious plans. In the universe it's set in, OCP would be akin to a multi-billion Fortune 500 company, a giant in the industry, producing everything from home appliances to weapons for the military. Their next big project would be the construction of Delta City a modern, sleek upgrade to replace the old, dilapidated neighborhoods of Detroit. But as we'll see, OCP has their own ulterior motives in this endeavor. However, one major obstacle stands in their way, and that is the cancer of crime that's plagued the city. OCP was then given the reins to fund and run the city's police, given that they appear to have the mutual goal of cleaning up the city to begin construction. With the police in their pocket, OCP's evil side begins to surface. Their incompetence, or rather their deliberate decision to mismanage police resources becomes apparent. We hear the cops in their locker rooms complain about the lack of backup and medical support during their missions, with things becoming so bad that they threaten to go on strike. With a poorly managed police force and the ever-increasing trend of crime, OCP would turn to alternative means of law enforcement. It is here that we meet one of the most villainous characters in the franchise, Richard Jones. A corrupt senior president and the number two man in the company, Richard was an executive consumed with greed and lust for power and wouldn't have a moment's hesitation to resort to ruthless means. Essentially, he is a white collar murderer he is a man with such a fearsome reputation that other executives would rather flee in their piss-laden pants than risk being associated with his wrath. Richard's callousness is the first thing we see about him. In response to the increased deaths in the police force due to OCP's restructuring, Richard just shrugs it off and says if they can't stand the heat, they should get out of the kitchen. To reduce the crime rate, or as he claims, Richard would introduce his pet project, the Enforcement Droid 209, or ED 209 in short, a fully mechanized robot designed for urban pacification, a law enforcement unit that can run 24 7 without sleep. However, this is all merely a means to an end, as Richard's ultimate goal is not to reduce the crime rate but to sell ED-209 to the military. In actuality, to stimulate demand for his project, Richard is in cahoots with Clarence Boddicker, the sadistic loyal crime boss and cop killer. It's a testament to how weakened the police force is and to the state of the corruption of the company when the city's number one felon is able to walk through the doors of OCP in broad daylight. Richard does not want the crime rate to be curbed, at least not yet, until his ED-209 project takes off. This is why OCP deliberately mismanages the police force to weaken them, paving the way for his product. Essentially, Richard is akin to a war profiteer, similar to Moriarty from A Game of Shadows, supplying both the bullets and bandages. By his support of Clarence, Richard is creating both the demand and the solution to the problem. Richard is an opportunist, seeing the potential for selfish gain in every situation. Even the construction of Delta City would serve his selfish motives, as it would mean two million workers living in trailers, 
which would be virgin territory for a vice ring of drugs, gambling, and prostitution. This he uses to entice Clarence to remain his lapdog. Richard's callousness is further seen when his presentation of Ed 209 goes awry. The young and enthusiastic Mr. Kenny is tragically killed in a weapons demonstration, but Richard merely shrugs it off as a glitch. Much can be said about the incompetence of the tech crew, but the fact that Richard and his team weren't convicted of manslaughter is a crime in itself. And later in the restroom scene with Bob Morton after Richard gripes about his lost military contract, he shows his lack of social responsibility when he blatantly admits that he didn't care if his product worked out or not. With Richard fumbling the ball with Ed 209's failure, the attention is diverted to Bob Morton, an ambitious but haughty executive who sees this as an opening for his RoboCop project. Unlike Richard's creation, the RoboCop project would not be fully robotic, but would require a human subject. This is again another reason for OCP's restructuring of the police force, to put prime candidates on the front lines where they are more likely to be killed in action. And combined with their mismanagement where the cops are unlikely to receive backup and medical support, this is made even more likely. So in essence, the mutilation of Officer Alex Murphy was partly OCP's fault to say the least. Clarence Boddicker may have done the physical assault but it was OCP's leadership that made it possible. And on a side note, it's possible that Murphy and the other RoboCop 2 candidates may not have known of their fate to become cyborgs when they signed their release forms. They might have been duped from some sneaky contractual wording on OCP's part. Another aspect of OCP's evil as a corporate entity is seen by their dehumanizing of Murphy a theme that runs through in all three films. This is seen in their inconsistency in how they label him in his state as RoboCop. Internally, within themselves, they refer to him as a cyborg, or a cybernetic organism, which is the correct term, as what remains of Murphy is still very much alive in the suit. But externally, when dealing with the press and the lawyers, OCP treats RoboCop as simply a product, or in more detail, a machine that uses some human parts. Where it gets unethical is that despite having a human in the suit, they expect the unconditional compliance of a programmed robot and constantly seek to suppress Murphy's humanity. To put it simply, they are taking away a person's free will. Dr. Marie from RoboCop 3 put it best when she said, how can you interface human components with a machine and complain when the human part makes a decision? This suppression of Murphy's humanity is seen when OCP decides to separate Murphy from his wife. While it might be better for Murphy's wife to move on, that is still her choice to make. Denying that choice by lying to her, saying her husband is dead, is deceptive to say the least. At least in the 2014 remake, Murphy was still able to have a relationship with his wife and son. As RoboCop, Murphy is governed by three prime directives, but due to the cunning nature of Richard Jones, a secret fourth directive was installed, one where RoboCop would be unable to act against an officer of OCP. By installing such a directive, Richard is declaring himself to be above the law, and given that OCP controls the police force, it's of little surprise that he feels he has a permanent get-out-of-jail-free card. Out of jealousy and resentment against Bob Morton for disrespecting him, Richard's ruthless nature is seen when he employs Clarence to kill Bob for him. With his feared reputation and from how acquainted he is with Clarence, it's likely that this isn't the first time that Richard has resorted to underhanded means to advance his position in the company. Later, Richard resorts to murder again, when Clarence spills the beans on his partnership to RoboCop. Out of fear, he orders the police to turn on him, as RoboCop's memory of Clarence's confession would serve as evidence. It's somewhat poetic that Richard would make the same mistake 
he chided Clarence for when he gloats to Robocop over the fact that he killed Bob Morton. This becomes his undoing, as this recording exposes him for the evil, conniving murderer he is, right before he is executed in front of the company's board of executives. Unfortunately, Richard's death did not spell the end of evil in OCP. We soon learn that the company's chief officer, who is only known in the films as the old man, is no saint either. If anything, the old man is just as devious as Richard was. As the situation in Detroit worsens, the old man proceeds to use the situation to the company's advantage. The city already owes OCP a debt they cannot repay. Now he proceeds to cut the pensions and the salaries of the police force to deliberately cause them to go on strike. With more chaos on the streets, normal economic activities cannot resume. The city would go into even more debt to OCP, being stuck in a vicious cycle. The old man is counting on the mayor to default on his payment, which would grant OCP uncontested foreclosure on all the city's contracts, due to a cleverly worded term in their agreement. Effectively, the old man is holding the city hostage until ownership is given to him, as crime and carnage fill the streets while he remains indifferent to the death he's causing. In his own words, he is taking Detroit private, looking to own the city, after which he would raid it just like any other corporation. Democracy would be thrown out the window. Countless citizens would be displaced from their homes, as only the rich would be able to afford the OCP stock needed to stay in Delta City. It's a somewhat interesting thought, as in real life there are actual conglomerates that are richer than the GDP of entire countries, let alone a city. Although in real life, it would not make financial sense for a company to buy a country, even if they could. After making the crime problem worse, OCP would need to clean up their mess. Enter the RoboCop 2 program, a supposed improvement over the original with more firepower to deal with the escalated crime. This introduces us to Dr. Juliet Fax, a psychologist who becomes in charge of the program. Juliet can be simply described as a mad scientist. Due to the failed attempts to recreate the success with Murphy, Juliet comes to the insane decision to use psychotic criminals instead for her subjects, believing that the promise of power and immortality would entice them to survive. This decision somehow gets approved, most likely due to Juliet being able to seduce her way into a scandalous relationship with the old man. A further sign of the decadent state of the company's chief leader. Eventually, Juliet settles on Kane, the local herbs and spices lord, and unethically takes him off life support, killing him. But the evil doesn't stop there. A glimmer of hope appears for the mayor, albeit it would be striking a deal with the devil. He would attempt to borrow cash from the new kingpin to repay his debt to OCP. Of course, the old man isn't having any of this and looks to snuff out any hope for the city. Together with his team, the old man decides to resort to murder, unleashing the newly created Robocane onto the mayor, who barely manages to escape the massacre. The blood of the mayoral staff and these criminals, together with the underage kingpin, are on OCP's already stained hands. Later, the foolishness of Juliet's decision becomes apparent, as Robocane goes on an uncontrolled rampage during their presentation at City Hall causing the deaths of more innocent civilians. This becomes a PR nightmare for OCP, which then has to put its plans on hold for damage control. Juliet is framed to take the fall, possibly with fabricated evidence, but it would seem that the old man got his comeuppance as well. While his fate is never specified, we know that he loses his position as the company's head, and later, in the third film, Johnson uses the old man as an example to warn a fellow executive that everyone is expendable. The incident with Robocane was the first nail in the coffin for OCP. 
They would go on to be acquired by a Japanese conglomerate, but the company's ambition to acquire Detroit still remains. In the climax of their decadence, OCP's new leadership turns to brute force, using military might to evict the citizens from their homes, under the guise of relocating them. Resistance is met with lethal force as the city turns into a war zone with people being shot dead in the streets simply for refusing. Essentially, OCP has become a militant conqueror, invading their city like a tyrant. The company continues to rack up their kill count and in particular the death of Officer Ann Lewis is on their hands as well, brutally killed in the line of duty while standing up for the helpless. OCP then tries to compel what little is left of the police force to take up arms against the citizens, which promptly leads all of them to quit on the spot. Eventually, a group of citizens manage to send out a TV broadcast, exposing the company for the corrupt corporation it is. Their share price plummets, and even the new CEO decides to bail. While the company would continue to survive under its Japanese parent, its reign of terror over Detroit was finally over. Overall, OCP was a corporation characterized by greed and led by unethical leadership who placed themselves above the law, who justified their heinous crimes all in the name of profit and power. It should be noted that throughout the trilogy, all the major OCP executives are arrogantly stuck up with a sense of superiority treating other citizens less fortunate than them with disdain. While that may not be considered evil per se, it's certainly undesirable behavior. Their own ambition led to their downfall, and it's somewhat poetic that the arm of justice that brought judgment on them came from their own hand. So what do you think of OCP, folks? Let me know in the comments below, and thanks for watching.